Last week, uh, Tom Lodge, one of our council members, quite a scene one here in Los Angeles, proclaimed John Parkinson Day. And the speaker that you're here this morning, Stephen D, here's his book, Iconic Vision, John Parkinson, Architect of Los Angeles. They declared uh, John Parkinson Day a couple of weeks ago. So you're really in for a treat. This is true Los Angeles history. At the turn of the 20th century, John Parkinson was considered one of the most important architects of Los Angeles in that he was responsible for uh, you know, designing and building Bulls Wilshire, everybody knows, City Hall, Memorial Coliseum, uh, Union Station, many other buildings, as well as many homes. In fact, his own home is a beautiful uh, Mediterranean on Whitaker's Drive in uh, Santa Monica, right off of San Vicente. Still beautiful, you know, 100 years later. And you'll, you'll learn more about that, obviously. But right now, I get to introduce our speaker, Stephen E. right here, G-E-E. -E. And he, as you'll tell me the accent, it is from England, so we love him immediately just for that. He is a senior producer for ITV television. And he basically goes all around the world with stories. And I'm sure he'll tell you how he was enamored with John Parkinson, but he single-handedly did this entire project, which I'm very happy to say has been published by Angel City Press. They did my book, and the publisher, Patty Clister, where are you? Raise your hand. Because you'll want to meet with, you'll want to visit Patty's back there. You'll want to visit with Patty afterwards. She's a lot of fun. And speaking of afterwards, we will have a book signing immediately following the program. So sit back and relax. I think you're in for a real treat. This was first presented two weeks ago at City Hall to great acclaim. So please give a nice, warm round of applause to see you. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is uh, Architecture Lecture Series number 22. I'm going to have to guess that in the previous 21 lectures here, that this guy's ne name never came up. This is uh, John Parkinson. He was born in Scotland in Lancashire, England in 1861. And he grew up in Bolton. But John Parkinson's not just the most important British architect in Los Angeles history. I would argue that he's the greatest public architect in the history of the city. No other architect did more to define the look and feel of Los Angeles as a city that embraced the future. And he did this at a time when uh, Los Angeles was really an outpost. Now for me, this project began as a documentary. I'm going to show you a short clip to give you a, a sense of who, who Parkinson was. Uh, Matt, if you could cue the clip, that would be fantastic. I don't have much luck with clickers. Los Angeles has been called the city of the future for at least a hundred years or so. There's a presumption in the part of people thinking about Los Angeles and living here that they live on the other side of the curve of time. John Parkinson was the greatest public architect of Los Angeles at a time when Los Angeles was inventing itself. He was so busy, he was such a founder through architectural statement of Los Angeles that he's almost co-terminal, uh, co-identified with the city itself. Parkinson's a mystery in the sense that there's so little written about him, but his legacy is entirely you know, before our very eyes in the built environment of Los Angeles in iconic ways. Wilshire uh, is Art Deco, and the Art Deco style is joyful, and festive, optimistic. And, and here is a building which is at once a, a, a piece of, uh, of engineering and practical department store construction, but also it's a total sculpture. It's an Art Deco uh, sculpture announcing, almost like a piece of music, almost like a leap motif, announcing the Great Gatsby decade, uh, the great uh, development of uh, Los Angeles in a westward uh, direction. I would rank it as one of the two top historic buildings in Los Angeles, the other being Union Station. It was the last great train station built anywhere in the world. The building 
signifies the culmination of a great controversy in Los Angeles and building it in a kind of beautiful, uh, stunning way that's lasting, sort of puts a peaceful ending to tremendously acrimonious times. When I think of John Parkinson's design for the Los Angeles City Hall, I think of a great modern, assertive tower that rises, uh, suggesting the future, suggesting a new city, uh, suggesting uh, a, a culture untrammeled by the past. I think the irony uh, of Parkinson's career is that uh, he created uh, these monumental, iconic buildings uh, and structures in Los Angeles that, that have come to define the city. But uh, he was working uh, concurrently with uh, the sort of darlings of uh, architectural history and criticism, Richard Nitra, Rudolf Schindler, uh, Franklin Wright. Um, they are the architects because they were modernists who got all the attention. Uh, none of them created the same kind of monumental or iconic imagery uh, that came out of the office of uh, John Parkinson. Now, what, what makes Parkinson sort of more fascinating? More, more important in some ways that he wasn't educated in the, an expensive academy in, in Paris or Rome. He didn't travel to MIT or Harvard on his father's time. John Parkinson was the son of a mill worker. There was no expectation for him. He was an average student. He didn't particularly enjoy going to school. And importantly, he knew that his parents would never, ever be able to afford the artistic education that he so craved. When he left school at age 13, he swept floors at hardware school. And it wasn't until his life, uh, until he turned 16, that his life began to show any kind of focus. He's 16 in this photograph here. This is when he became a, a builder's apprentice. And for six years, he gained a thorough understanding of the construction industry. And at the end of that six year apprenticeship, in 1883, he came to North America with $5 in a toolbox looking for short-term adventure. Uh, Parkinson traveled to Winnipeg and built fences, and then he traveled to Minneapolis. And in one of those great American stories, he rises in a, in a sawmill in a very short period of time to become the foreman of the sawmill. And at the end of those uh, two years in America, Parkinson goes back to Britain. And he goes back to Britain with this new, incredible American experience that he has, and this opportunity he's been given in America, and he thinks he's going to transfer those skills to life in Britain. But he soon finds that none of the British boy employers were really interested in his American experience. They wanted to put him back at a level that was just above apprentices. And Parkinson wasn't interested. After he tasted the optimism and the positivity of America, life in Britain seemed quite dull by comparison. He walks into a, an art gallery in Bolton and he stares at this photograph. This is a photograph of the uh, Golden Gate, the view from Telegraph Hill. Parkinson stares at it and he makes a decision right there and then that he's going back to America. He's going to expand that American experience. All he knows about California at the time is that it's a warm, tropical country where one is well advised to be polite in order to avoid being shot or stabbed. <laughs> Parkinson settles in Napa, and just as he'd done in Minneapolis, he becomes the foreman of the sawmill. And it's here that he becomes an architect almost by accident. He's working on plans for his own house in his, uh, in his landlord's place. And his landlord's playing cards. And he stands up and he looks at Parkinson's plans and he says, Wow, they're pretty good. My brother works at the bank in Napa and they're looking to make an addition. I think you could do it. Parkinson is nothing but full of confidence. And he designs the structure on the right, which is an addition to the Bank of Napa. And right here, an architect is born. Confidence 
It's not something Parkinson's lacking. He makes a permanent decision that really that's where his future lies. He enters a number of competitions and within a short period of time he receives a letter from friends who moved to Seattle suggesting that there are opportunities for a young architect like him. So he, he heads to Seattle and he finds that none of the established architects will hire him. So in true Parkinson fashion, he sets up his own office and he puts a two foot sign in front of the door that says John Parkinson Architect and he will never ever again work for anybody else. He arrives in the spring of 1889 and within a short period of time, literally within a couple of years, he becomes one of the most established architects in Seattle. He becomes Seattle's first schools architect and superintendent of construction, designing over 30 schools in the Pacific Northwest, including the BFA School, which is uh, Seattle's longest continuously operating school. It's still there. He designs the Butler Block and the Seattle National Bank, perhaps the finest example of Romanesque architecture period in the city. And you think, this guy literally designed his house, he designed an addition to the Bank of Napa, and now he's designing this. Parkinson did this because he studied all of the architectural journals of the period. He was obsessed by being the best that he could possibly be, and he was prepared to study on his own time to do it, because Parkinson had no formal education. Of course, the Seattle National Bank building is still there. That's going to become a bit of a running theme in this, uh, in this talk today. In 1893, there's an economic downturn in Seattle. And John Parkinson decides, in order to improve his prospects, in order to take care of his family, he has to leave. So in 1894, he heads to Los Angeles. Now imagine, in 1894, Los Angeles has a population of just over 50,000 people. People get back by a horse and buggy, the majority of structures in the downtown, uh, downtown business districts are two-story, some four-story structures, but mostly they're pretty small. But what it lacks in, uh, in numbers, what it lacks in structures, Los Angeles makes up in ambition. Los Angeles has the ambition to become the greatest city on earth. John Parkinson is absolutely the right man and in the right place at the right time. But in order to compete with established East Coast cities such as Chicago and New York, where populations are already over a million, it needs to grow up, literally. This is the home of Loughlin Building. 1896, John Parkinson designed this. It's the first steel frame structure in Los Angeles. You may recognize it, it's the home of the Grand Central Market. It's still there, and it's still a vibrant part of life in Los Angeles. Now, when you think about John Parkinson, it's important to think about the transitional stages a town needs to go through to become a metropolis. 1902, John Parkinson designs the first skyscraper. Remember, 1894, 18, he gets here, the population is 50,000, he's already built the city's first skyscraper. Again, it's still there, it's the Brady Block on the corner of 4th and Spring Street. John Hyde Brady was criticised because people said, 4th and Spring Street is too far out of town, people aren't going to travel to go to your building. 1902, a young man by the name of uh, George Edward Bertram walks into John Parkinson's office. He's hired immediately as a draftsman. But Edward Bertram has much bigger ambitions than just being a draftsman. In 1903, he marries into a wealthy Wisconsin family. And in 1905, he buys into a partnership with Parkinson. But Parkinson doesn't need a partner. At this point, He's already the most established architect in the city, so it's likely that he paid a hefty fee. 
1306. This is the city's first world-class hotel. It's the Alexandria Hotel. You wouldn't think that if you went in now, but when it opened, it was really intended to rival the opulence of the Palace Hotel in San Francisco. This place was incredible. Presidents stayed here. Charlie Chaplin stayed here. United Artists was formed in the lobby. This was really a statement about where Los Angeles was headed. In fact, Parkinson and Bergson designed all four structures on the corner of 5th and Spring Street, including the Tyler Insurance Building, the, Croc uh, the Citizens National Bank, the Security Building, and they all did it for uh, two guys named uh, Rowan and Berkey. Now, Mr. Berkey, who we see here, Albert Berkey, cut his teeth in Arizona managing hotels. He came to Los Angeles and took over the Hollenbeck Hotel. He was known to fuss over every little detail, but he was a perfect business partnership, partner with Parkinson. Although Parkinson walked in his office one day and said, Mr. Berkey, you look really tired. You look like you could, need, you could do a break. And Mr. Berkey turns around to him and says, I'm going to take a break. In fact, me and my wife are sailing next week on the Lusitania. Of course, he never came back. His wife made it, but he didn't. Parkinson Bergstrom designed the Pacific Mutual Insurance Building. After the uh, earthquake in San Francisco, they moved their headquarters to Los Angeles. It's still there. It looks quite different now, but it's still there. Parkinson uh, redesigned uh, central, what was Central Park, it's now Pershing Square. He put a neat cross pattern intersected by a fountain. And of course, he did it for free. Parkinson was very determined that whenever the opportunity came to do something for the city without payment, he did it. This is the Los Angeles Athletic Club, built in 1911. It's still there. It still looks fantastic. Parkinson and Bergstrom's empire spread out as far as Dallas, Texas, with the Southland Hotel, to Utah with the Utah Hotel, Hotel Utah, and the Taft and Penlow building in Oakland, California. Now, the partnership with Bergstrom ends in 1915. A lot of architects in the city are wondering, where's my next paycheck going to come from? In December of 1916, John Parkinson walks into the office of Building Inspector J.J. Backus with an enormous roll of plans under his arm. <coughs> These plans represent the first stage of construction for the terminal warehouse market on 7th and Central Avenue. The estimated cost of the entire project was $10 million. That's over, well, it's close to a quarter of a billion in today's money. It was the central place for distributing goods throughout the region and taking Los Angeles produce or regional produce as far as the East Coast. Again, it's an essential building block in that transition to a metropolis. And again, it's still there. I knew nothing about this structure until I started working on this project. It's incredible. If you ever get a chance, go check it out. <coughs> now, after the war, confidence returns to the construction industry. Parkinson is contacted by George Finley Bobart, the president of a small Methodist institution. Bobart understands that in order to compete with major cities on the East Coast, his institution needs to expand. And he asks Parkinson to come up with a master plan to set it on the road to becoming one of the most important educational establishments in the country. You, you might recognize it as USC. Of course it's still there. It still looks fantastic. Parkinson designed at least 20 projects on the USC campus, and eight of which we know are still there. But when you walk around the campus and you see its unique architectural style, and all the structures that have followed have been designed to align to Parkinson's original concept. Now in 1920, John Parkinson takes on perhaps the only part of the part of it that makes sense to him, his son Donald. Donald is an MIT graduate, 
and he's up to date with the latest styles, and he really joins his father's practice at a time when Los Angeles is making perhaps its ultimate statement about its ambition. This is the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, which was directly linked to a bid to bring the Olympic Games to Los Angeles. Now imagine, 20 years earlier, Los Angeles has a population of just over 100,000 people. And now it's competing with the amazing, uh, established cities such as Paris and Rome to bring the Olympic Games to Los Angeles. William Garland travels to Europe with Parkinson's plans as a centerpiece of that bid. And unfortunately, he finds that the 24 games are promised to Paris, the 28 games are promised to Amsterdam, but the 32 games will come to Los Angeles. And he, this is a picture taken shortly after the first stage of construction was finished in 1923, allowing for 75,000 people. And you may think that when that track was finished, that the first race around it was perhaps some international athletic tournament or something similar, but it was actually a race inspired by John Parkinson. John Parkinson, who was 61, challenged Zach Farmer, who was the manager of the Coliseum, and Ellie Dixon, the contractor, to a race. And they ran around the track. And halfway around, Parkinson was so out of breath that he decided right there and then to end any athletic ambition. <laughs> of course, this is a shot from the 1932 Olympics. John and Donald Parkinson Return. They had the, added the Olympic torch, they added an additional 25,000 seats. And for the two weeks that the Olympics were here, Los Angeles was the most talked about city in the world. The ambition to create an international city of significance was complete, and John Parkinson played a major role in it. Of course, it's still there, and it's still a vibrant, important part of Los Angeles' life. Now in 1925, after that first stage of construction is completed, John Parkinson sits on a committee, a committee to find an architect for the new Los Angeles City Hall. The existing structure on Broadway just didn't cut it anymore. It was made in 1880 when the population was about 30,000. Population that is now well over a million people. And while John Parkinson may, may at this point be an obvious choice to design the structure, it wasn't as easy as you might imagine. Politics got in the way. While the city council, uh, well, sorry, while the board of public works believed it was their decision to choose a new architect to design this incredible structure. The City Council believed it was their decision. The Board of Public Works went as far as um, suggesting that a team made up of John Parkinson, fellow of John C. Austin and A.C. Martin could do the structure. And then the City Council was so disgusted that the Board of Works had hired somebody, they went and gave the, firm, the contract to a firm called Kirtland and Bill. The problem was that nobody told the firm of Kirtland and Bill Further further, the further occurred that Bill didn't even apply for the job. When Los Angeles Times showed up at Alexander Cutler's office and said, Hey, Mr. Cutler, what are you going to do with the structure? He said, I, I don't know, we only found out an hour ago that we couldn't do it. Anyway, that was never going to last. There was a legal tussle. And what you're looking at is Park John Parkinson's original concept for City Hall. I found this in a box. Uh, one of his relatives had it, didn't really know much about it, but it's quite a find. And what they went on to construct was really a bold statement. A bold statement that really fit the times about the possibilities for Los Angeles. The direction of where it was headed. When this structure opened in 1928, half a million people lined the streets. Remember, John Parkinson got here, there were 50,000 people in the entire city. 
Whether the Los Angeles Times wrote that LA was a city that grew up under John Parkinson's hand, it, it was no longer a compliment. And my, the entire lighting equipment for MGM Studios lights up the structure, and at the top of it, the Charles Lindbergh beacon. As you know, it's still there. It's still perhaps the most recognizable, iconic structure in the entire state. 1925. Donald Parkinson heads to Paris. And he goes to a personnel from the Bullock store downtown, also designed by John Parkinson. What he finds in Paris at the exposition in Paris is a new architectural style. That style is fun, it's creative, and it really speaks to the period. And while John and Donald Parkinson would implement Art Deco, or what would come to be known as Art Deco, in a number of structures, none of them is more celebrated than Bullock's Worship. An absolute cathedral of commerce. There's no other structure like this. Before, long before I knew who John or Donald Parkinson was, I used to drive down Wilshire Boulevard hoping for a red light just so I could sit and stare at this building. Now, the Parkinsons did a lot of things, but they also transformed the way that people in Los Angeles shot. The main entrance to Bullock's Wilshire, for I guess some of you here may have shot there, but the main entrance was at the rear of the building under a port share. The Parkinson's embraced the automobile culture. People got out underneath Herman Sachs' mule, the spirit of transportation. This became an instant hit with celebrities in the city. Marlene, Marlene Dietrich, Greg Garbo, John Wayne, they all shot him. In fact, Mae West famously wouldn't shot here. She used to park her car at the rear and insisted on staff members in the store bringing the clothes to here while she ran down the window. <laughs> it was also a place where one particular young actress, who you may recognize, got her first, what start, her first job in Los Angeles. I originally went to Bullocks to get a sort of temporary job. My family and I, my mother and my friends, we needed the money desperately, so it was Christmas time. And, uh, you know, uh, short-term uh, jobs were often available at Christmas time in stores. They, they hired extra help, in other words. But I managed to land on my feet and was taken on as a cashier. And I, I was in a little hole in the wall off the main uh, thoroughfares of the uh, cosmetic department. And uh, uh, the salespeople were passing through the sales check with the money, and uh, I would get the change and get them back there, a sales check. So that was how I began, and uh, I learned pretty fast how to do that. I was about 16 at the time, and I just come from England two years previously. I spent two years in New York, so I was, you know, I was very used to the American way. But it, it was a very exciting place to work because it was it really was the creme de la creme of uh, big shops <coughs> in Los Angeles. It was Bullock's and it was Bullock's Wilshire, you see. Now, I had to beg her for a year to do that interview. I sent the flowers on every occasion. I found out when her birthday was. And when I finally did it, I sat down and uh, I said to her, you know, I thank you so much for doing this. And I, I looked at her. And I almost wanted to cheer up because it had taken so long to actually get her to do it. And I said to her, do you remember much about working in Bullock's Worship? And she said, not really. <laughs> Fortunately, she was joking. Um, this is John and Donald Parkinson. And it's incredible to me when you think of all the structures that we've seen up to this point, that more people know that Frank Lloyd Wright built a house in Hollywood and know that either of these two guys are. I would argue that all the structures that you've seen up to this point are worthy of it being remembered, but what they're actually working on right now are the plans for a union station for Los Angeles. But the prospect of a union station began as early as 1905, but the three railroads fought that prospect 
with such vigour that one of their attorneys once joked that he was training his grandchildren to take on the fight. They didn't want to share facilities. But what um, John and Donald Parkinson come, come up with is really an incredible structure. Again, when it opens in 1939, half a million people come to see the opening uh, inauguration day celebrations. The theme of the celebrations is transportation that has existed in the city prior to the station. And you think about all those different forms of transportation, horse and buggy, bicycle, car, Parkinson's lifetime went through all of these different stages. He really was there at the important time when Los Angeles transitioned from an outpost to a metropolis. And although he didn't live to see the completion of Union Station, what he leaves us with is almost the sum total of his entire architectural experience. It's a Spanish station. It has a Spanish roof. It has a Moorish tower. And there are deco and Gothic others celebrated and all throughout the station. I would argue in conclusion that John Parkinson is not just the most important British architect in Los Angeles history. He is the greatest public architect in the history of Los Angeles. Thank you.